warm welcome once again. And uh, Abdul Aziz is our uh, mentor today. He is basically instructor in uh, MST, and uh, he is our senior member uh, in uh, FSO and uh, ICPG. So over to Abdul Aziz. And today, uh, by the way, uh, Vinod will be our co-host. Vinod Kumar, uh, he is uh, our co convener in ISPG and uh, uh, one of the admin in FSO also. And there are a few other uh, panel members in the group already. Uh, Mr. Dharma, Dharmeda, Sunil, Sunil, there are many actually. Okay, warm well, welcome to everyone once again and uh, let's start. Abdulaziz. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Libin. And unfortunately, you didn't show your face to all of us. You just said something and you, you know. Yeah, later, uh, later on. <laughs> so I want this to be a very interactive session. I want everybody to be excited. And, uh, you know, whenever you have something, just ask and we continue. We have a lot more other senior members here. Apart from Mr. Libin, we have Mr. Vinod Kumar. I believe I've just seen uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dharma somewhere here and uh, Mr. Sunil, uh, Mr. Kingston and you know there are so many other senior members as well to answer you. Uh, so uh, whatever it comes across please let us know and uh, we will discuss and we will uh, you know we will try to clarify uh, your questions as much as possible. Now the importance of the the reason of uh, you know these kind of workshop is to you know keep up keep, you know, coordinate uh, with all our, you know, uh, members. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, try to pass the information what we gained from FSO to our, you know, the newcomers. Like I came to FSO, I learned a lot from my seniors. Now it's my responsibility to share that to, you know, the newcomers. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Okay. So if you have any time, you can pause and you can ask me, but try to mute your speakers whenever it is possible and, uh, you know, and activate your speakers only when, when, when you want to speak. So in that way, we can avoid a lot of unnecessary, you know, uh, sounds from here and there. So let me start then. Uh, a lot of people, they ask me, uh, I'm sharing my screen. Can all of you see my screen now? It's coming up. It's coming up. Yeah, we can see now. Okay, just hold on. Just let me just. Okay, here it is. Uh, so I hope all of you can see and all of you can you know hear me properly. So let us start. So basic photography, we are, we are planning to discuss, uh, you know, all the area of photography, you know, uh, in, in a basic level. We are not concentrating in any particular area, but rather we will be covering every area and we'll try to answer your questions. Now, Just hold on, people. I might okay. Now let me talk about different types of photography because the people, you know, are being uh, you know an FSO member, there are a lot many you know new members. They come and ask us that what kind of uh, camera I should buy, what kind of lens I should buy, what kind of uh, setting I should do. These are really, really you know questions which we cannot answer until unless we don't know what you are on to okay uh, there are some people i i see them always they are after landscapes there are some people they are into wildlife they are not into anything else there are some people after macro photography which is you know i'll come to that later so macro photography for me macro photography is very very difficult because i went after it's a lot of time consuming that's it's not kind of my photography so i'm not much into that Astrophotography, it's very interesting. People like Mr. Ajay and, you know, uh, Mr. Dharma and, you know, almost all of our senior people, they are after this. But I find that this is not a good idea for most, so many other people. So that is the reason we are trying to have a discussion with different types of photography today. So aerial photography, portraits, 
documentary, sports, fashion, street photography, product photography, food and architecture. Now, why we are discussing about this is each photography is different from one another. Maybe we are all using, uh, you know, a DSLR or any other camera to capture photos, but the technology, the techniques, the idea, the concept, everything is totally different from one to another. That's why we are discussing. And then you try to match yourself, which is, you know, more exciting for you. For me, uh, you know, astrophotography, I love that. And apart from that, fashion photography, portraitures, and so on. But uh, there are some photography which I never tried and I don't want to try. So I like, you know, food photography. But I find people, they are very much fascinated about food photography and they have set up a huge, uh, you know, uh, set up within their house itself to do food photography. So this is all taste to taste, you know, that is so just try to understand what is your taste, what kind of photo normally you like, or what kind of photos normally you watch, you know. So now let's have a look. This is aerial photography. Here, totally everything is different. Aerial photography, it's not that we do with a camera sitting in a corner. Rather, we need to take it from the top. Nowadays, people are using even, you know, different kind of drones and so on, the latest techniques to, you know, capture aerial photography. And it's, it's a, a little more expensive and a little more advanced and you need more, uh, you know, gears to do this. Now, this one is architectural photography. Basically, you need the widest angle lens to cover maximum area from a very limited you know, space. So that is, that's why it is different. And also, you have to deal with a lot of distortion, a lot of lighting issues, you know, a lot of permissions and, you know, so on. So this is totally different. But people, they create stunning images out of architectures, architecture photography. And this one is, you know, you can see this is candid photography. So basically, these are, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, uh, people and at their own. That means without posing in front of a camera. They don't know what they're doing, but this is really exciting and, you know, it, it will directly tell you different stories. This is what I was talking to you before, macro photography. Basically, in macro photography, we are dealing with very small objects. So here, light is a big issue. Apart from that, focusing is a very, very big issue. And the lens choice is another issue. Uh, but you can create a whole world on your tabletop. And you can really enjoy if you know macro photography. So that's a totally different. They have different setup. They have different uh, aperture setting. Apart from a landscape or apart from a portraiture photography, this is totally different. So even though we are doing everything, all this photography by using a camera, but their techniques and other things are totally different. And here, this is a kind of conceptual photography, you know. Uh, yeah. And this is documentary. Here we are trying to document something. Even wedding is also considered as a kind of document. Wedding photography is a big, uh, uh, you know, big segment of all this, uh, you know, photography. Maybe one of the biggest money maker uh, in the photography section. But still, it is a kind of documenting thing. You, nobody will pose you. You know, things are moving one by one, one after another. You have to move according to the pace. Okay, after the wedding or before the wedding, you can do a lot of shooting, but during the wedding, you have to be with the moments. Okay, so you have to match yourself. The events will not wait for you. This is one of such an event. This is a traditional uh, camel race. It's around 120 kilometers away from Muscat. It's a very fine, you know, a fine morning. It's around five, you know, six o'clock it started. And we were there with, uh, with the support of uh, Sheikh Nasser. And this is again another uh, documentary type of photography. Uh, there we are trying to, you know, why I showed you this particular photos because in each photo, we have to discuss a lot of things. When you do a, a documentary photography, you also have to show the location where it is. Hello, you're listening everybody? Yes, all good. Uh, okay. 
so somebody came in between, uh, you know, that's, that's the reason. Okay. Now, documentary photography, you have to show a lot of things to say that this is happening in this particular place or in a particular culture on this is what, you know, if you don't see the background, then you will think it's just a bull is running after somebody. You don't know. Now you know that this is in an arena. There are a lot of people watching it, uh, you know, and uh, this is a kind of uh, action happening or a sport is happening. And, uh, you know, a bull is from that, a bull is running after, uh, you know, a competitor or, may, uh, or a participant. So that's what it is. But at the same time, you don't want a lot of disturbance from the, the people who are sitting there, but you need them. You need them there, but you don't want them a lot in the picture. So the techniques and ideas are totally different here. And this is fashion photography. Here we rather concentrate on, on, on the dress or whatever you're trying to portray rather than in the picture. So this is another one. And this is food photography. Uh, this is, you need a lot of concentration on this. You need to know how to focus, how to stack your focuses and how to, you know, prepare your, you know, your composition, how to set up your, uh, you know, uh, scenes or frames. And uh, you also need to have a lot of preps to, you know, make it ready. Now, if you look at these spoons, the spoons have got a lot of things on the spoons which gives you different kind of colors and combinations. So this is by knowingly, they, you know, they put it. So the people, they know photography, they also know that, uh, you know, which other color is good when they match and they give you a good and a vibrant screen, okay? They can present you a good and vibrant screen in front of you. So, yeah, this is, of course, landscape photography. This is nighttime photography. So here, uh, you know, something is new is getting introduced, the tripod, because nighttime photography always require a tripod. Okay, even uh, food photography also require a, you know, tripod, even most of this photography. But the night photography is always, you cannot do it without a tripod properly. You can do it, but not properly. So you require a tripod here. Nighttime photography again. And this is photojournalism or, you know, here we are not looking at the clarity or your megapixel something. Here you need the incident. You need to capture the events. Okay. Again, it is back to portrait photography here. It's again, you need a lot of quality, colors, combinations, beauty, so on. This is one. And again, it's sports photography here. When you do fo sports photography, again, you're talking about speed. Okay. Uh, so you need to... One second. Yeah. Uh, I think there are some newcomers. Uh, you have to name your uh, profile properly. When you join, give your name, same as what when you join the group. I'm repeating again because I can see some you said join with a username and some WTF, I don't know what you meant but uh, just rename it. Otherwise, I will remove you from the, uh, the, uh, the meeting, okay? And uh, Abdullah says, when you uh, switch to the next screen, give a bit delay, because we are seeing it, uh, you know? Uh, okay. Bit delayed, uh, okay, thank you. So again, we are talking here about sports photography. When we talk about sports photography, that is definitely we are talking about the speed and pace and the events are happening right in front of you very fast and you need to run after that and you need to capture. So here you use a lot of different types of gears and you, you use something, you know, a lot of different techniques. So that's sports photography. Again, here sports photography, but using lights. Here's street photography. I'm not much into street photography, but we have some uh, people who are uh, very much into street photography. We can also ask them to contribute later on in the session. War photography. Yeah, this is wildlife photography. This is uh, another type of photography. You need a uh, uh, very expensive and very long and big, uh, you know, lenses and uh, preparations. 
and you need a lot of time to wait and get the right pictures because you are dealing with wildlife. They are not going to listen to you. They are not going to listen or they are not going to wait for you. Okay. And also it is very scary situation that you cannot go into uh, near to them and take photos. So you need to be safe first, then you need to wait for them and you need to capture them. So it is something totally different. So that is, uh, you can see one of our uh, wildlife photographers in Ephesus, Mr. Sumesh, uh, he's using his, uh, you know, Canon-like huge uh, lens and shooting, okay? And uh, I hope uh, you guys had a luck to listen to him uh, maybe a couple of weeks before. He's a wonderful photographer and a good friend of us. And uh, okay, for our wildlife center, you know, mostly we are into Corum Park. And these are some of the photos just to show you. Now let's talk about different types of cameras because every camera can do, you know, take photography and uh, do your job. So, but still you need to know what are they. Uh, previously we were using point and shoot cameras, you know, uh, it was a kind of fashion because it was so handy and easy. Nowadays, I'm not finding much people there using point and shoot cameras because even DSLR and the mirrorless cameras are getting smaller and smaller with uh, you know better quality. That's maybe the reason nowadays uh, point and shoot cameras are not much. Anyway, the first one is point and shoot cameras. The simple camera, you just look at your object and shoot. You have nothing to do. The job will be done by the camera for you. The next one is DSLR. So as we, we understand, this is digital single lens reflex. So I'll talk to you what is single lens reflex later. This is digital one. Previously, it was only SLR, not D. That means single lens reflex cameras without D. That means it was not digital. We were using film, you know, uh, photo films for that instead. So that is DSLR cameras. Uh, which is uh, very you know popular among all the photographers. The second one and the third one is bridge cameras. They they are uh, the cameras with uh, a lens. Mostly you cannot detach them or change the lens, but they are also good at their level. And the next one is the mirrorless cameras, where you will not have a mirror like DSLR. So in, because of the same reason, you will find them very small. Uh, and very handy at the same time they have they can get you much at picture quality and also this technique is uh, much faster developing than the DSLR according to because uh, you know a lot of things are getting mirrorless so we hope in the future we will find mostly mirrorless cameras around us and uh, the next one is for uh, is a medium format camera so medium format cameras are, uh, you know, cameras that can get you uh, bigger, uh, you know, uh, megapixels, bigger megapixels and, uh, oh, this is something came, one second. Everybody listening to me properly, right? Yes. One yes, second. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, now, uh, the medium format cameras, they are, uh, they can get you much bigger uh, and uh, their, uh, you know, sensor size is bigger than uh, the DSLRs. And these are uh, comparatively expensive cameras than DSLR and mirrorless, mostly fashion photographers and people, those who really make money out of this, they, they use, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, medium format cameras. I, I believe Mr. Vineet Sudan, one of our FSO uh, group member, he's a fashion photographer, he's using a a medium format camera. Uh, that means very less people uh, in the market or maybe, you know, they're using it, particularly those who make money, but some people like uh, we need their using it regularly. And after that, smartphone cameras. So these are the different types of cameras that are available, but we are talking in this particular class, particular, you know, training that, uh, uh, you know, cameras that can change aperture shutter speed ISO. If you can handle these things manually, then this, you know, course is good to go with. 
Now, this is what we were talking about, you know, uh, DSLR, digital single lens reflex. That means whatever you see, that's what you, you know, the, whatever the light comes through your lens, that is the same thing is, you know, coming through a pentaprism and hitting back to you, you know, if you see this picture, you can see the light coming through the lens and that is hitting on a mirror and then it goes up hitting on a pentaprism and then it turns back to your, your eyes. So whatever you see through the lens and that comes to, or, you know, reflects back to your eyes. So the same thing what you see, the same thing what you get. But uh, in a point and shoot camera, it is totally different. Whatever you see is not what you shoot because there are two different, uh, different things. Now, when we talk about uh, here, you know, a mirrorless camera, you see the, the light is reflected and, you know, and it is relaying to a pentaprism by, a, you know, mirror in the picture. In the, you know, mirrorless camera, you will not find that mirror. Instead, the light directly goes and hits on a, sorry, hits on a sensor. That is what happening in a mirrorless camera. And then from that sensor, the, you know, the picture electronically, it goes to your viewfinder and that's how you see that. So, so the biggest advantage and disadvantage of this is, you know, whenever you shoot on a mirrorless camera, uh, even your camera is in a clicked position, you can see the picture, but at the same time, on a DSLR camera, whenever you click, suppose you kept your camera for a 10 second slow shutter, uh, you know, capturing, then you will not see anything in the screen during that time, but in a, in a mirrorless camera, you can see that. Okay, so that is the difference. That is DSLR here, and you will see a pentaprism here. That is the thing that, uh, you know, takes the light from the mirror and, you know, bounce back to your eyes, uh, you know, on a, on a DSLR. Now we'll talk about different modes. Before I go to different types of settings, we have, of course, manual mode. You know, manual modes is the mode where you can adjust everything by yourself. It's a hundred percentage manual mode. You have nothing automatic there. Everything is controlled by you. This is the most, you know, creative mode of your camera. So whatever the way you want to take photos and it is at your disposal. Now let's talk about the aperture mode. Aperture mode is, you can set the aperture. Suppose I'm taking, going to take all the photos on 2.8 aperture. So I'll keep my aperture to 2.8 and the shutter speed will be adjusted by my camera. So you don't have to worry about the shutter speed. Some people are worried, you know, most of the people, they ask me which mode I should use. For me, I don't know. I'll say I don't know because for me, I use these modes for different purposes. That also will talk uh, you know, during the course of this, uh, you know, training. So the manual mode, you ha have to adjust ISO, you have to, uh, you know, adjust your aperture and you have to adjust your shutter speed by yourself. Now in the aperture mode, what happens is you keep, uh, you know, a particular aperture, like you're doing a wildlife photography, you don't have time to go with all that. So what you do is you keep an average 1.6 or maybe a six or maybe your 4.5 or 3.2, whatever the aperture you like to have, or maybe, you know, good for you, the subject, what you're looking for, you set that kind of an aperture. Now, we'll also talk during this course, how can you decide an aperture value based on the subject or based on the preparation, what you have, okay? That's we'll talk later. So now please do understand that, suppose I'm going to shoot a portraiture shooting with all with 2.0, or, you know, 3.2 aperture, then you just set your aperture, shutter speed will be, you know, set by the camera itself. So you have no headache. Otherwise, you know, you have to set both and you will have to vary whether the photo is, you know, uh, you know overexposed, the, whether the photo is, you know, underexposed one. In this case, you have nothing to vary because it will be controlled by your camera itself. And the second one is shutter, shutter speed, you know, shutter mode or maybe time mode in some camera, they call it T value, which is time mode. That means you keep your shutter. Suppose I'm going to do a panning. I want to capture a bike as you see here. Okay. 
Can all of you see this one here? A lady is riding a bicycle? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Now, to capture this particular, you know, uh, the screen, what I was looking for a shutter speed between 20 to 30. I was not sure, according to the calculations, you have to use half of the speed of the moving object. That's what I heard. That's what I know, according to me. So I was thinking I need to use a shutter speed about 20, or then if things are not okay, then I'll change it to 25 or 30, whatever the next possible level. Here, I don't want my shutter speeds, you know, speeds to be changed. At the same time, I don't care my aperture. I, don't, I just don't care my aperture, but I care only my shutter. This particular case, I keep my camera just you know, on 30 shutter speed. I don't want my shutter to be adjusted. At the same time, I just don't care my aperture. Whatever it is, it's okay for me, okay? And this is a particular case I use a shutter mode. So I turn into shutter mode, keep my shutter 30, leave my aperture to be decided by the camera. And I guess, of course, you can go manually or you can, if you have enough light. Yep. Any questions, please? It's okay, Abdulis. I think someone's uh, mic was uh, unmuted. So it's okay. Not a problem. Okay. So, this particular situation, I always use shutter mode. At the same time, I just click it here. Uh, Sumesh, uh, once uh, while discussing, he said, wildlife mostly. Sumesh, he said he's using, uh, you know, aperture mode. So he has his own reason. Maybe they don't want to look at, they will be looking at uh, the, you know, aperture setting and let the camera, uh, uh, you know, do the shutter settings by, by itself. I also use such, you know, uh, fashion photography mostly. I work with aperture mode because I am looking for a particular aperture uh, to capture a picture. And then I set that aperture and uh, let, you know, the camera decide the shutter speed because I always make sure that the way I take photos, I have enough light, either by ambient light or natural light or by, you know, artificial light setups, whatever it is, okay? So here we go here again. So I hope you understand what I'm saying. Now, what happens on a manual, cam manual setting? You have to change your shutter speed, you have to change your aperture and you have to change your ISO by yourself. What in a, you know, aperture mode, you set an aperture, Suppose you are setting aperture 3.2, then you just don't set anything. The shutter will be set by the camera. Now, there are some people, what they you do is they just keep the ISO automatic. So what happens? Camera will automatically adjust the ISO. The second option is that they set aperture, then shutter will be adjusted by the camera as well as the ISO will be adjusted by the camera. But you should know sometime you have to compromise the quality of your photograph, the creativity of your photograph, and those kind of stuff. If you know that, it's well and good. And, and after that, you will find some other modes like a sports mode, you know, uh, beauty mode. And those are kind of automatic setup by your camera. And it works. But uh, for me, I'm not interested in all that because... You know, it doesn't work in all the lighting conditions. Sometimes it works good for you. Sometimes, you know, they may you know, affect your photo by doing something wrong to your photo. So I'm not interested. I'm not, uh, you know, advising you people to go after that. But still, the sports, they say that if you are going to do sports photography, landscape photography, macro and fashion or portraiture, you can put in those modes. But uh, again, you have to set everything by yourself they will enhance certain things, but I don't find them, they are, you know, useful always. So I, I'm not interested. And that is not a thing to be taught here as well. So please do understand manual mode, aperture mode, shutter mode. And the next one is program mode. Basically, you can develop a certain programmed, you know, things according to, uh, you know, a pre-decided area. Maybe you are regularly going somewhere and doing something. You can prepare certain settings and keep it there. Okay, because people, they ask me a question, what is the EXIF? What is the setting for this particular photo? I hate to answer this question. 
because I don't remember that question. I don't remember the answer because I said it every now and then all are different. Okay. Every time it is different. Same photo. I take three days, three days. My settings will be different based on several reasons. Okay. So there is no particular situation. You just, you know, learn something, program it and you can do it. No, there is nothing like that. Okay. So any question in that particular mode, anybody want to ask any question here? You can ask me. You got two, three minutes, then we can move ahead. Anyone? Abdulaziz, this is Sayyid. Hi. Yeah, Sayyid, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. good. Uh, I just want to make one point here. Uh, whatever Abdul asked uh, to use uh, R2 ISO and aperture and shutter priority, that is he explained for uh, outdoor photography, that not applies immediately to indoor photography. Let's see, we uh, are talking basic photography here, Said. So basic yes. photography we normally do outside. We understand that we are not doing it with the light. So we are talking about the different modes here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to clear that one. It is applicable only for outdoor, not for the indoor. Yeah. We understand that indoor photography is done by advanced users. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, Abdul. Thanks, sir. Just want to introduce uh, Said. He is our uh, Nikon School uh, yeah. uh, instructor and uh, trainer. Uh, he is an expert. So. Again, <laughs> the creative is going Thank you, thank you, Daniel. thank you, Vahid. Yeah. Abdul Aziz. Yeah. yeah. Sir, I'm uh, actually okay. I should not ask, but uh, as a beginner. Yeah. Uh, which which mode you uh, you advise actually like beginner. I started with the aperture mode, then I changed to more man manual. So how is your aperture any suggestion? How is your aperture mode going? Do no, how I changed change to manual a particular mode. aperture in a situation. You, suppose you have given a situation. Do you know now? Suppose you are taking a portrait photography. Which aperture would you choose? Based on what? Do you have this idea? Yes. Do you have this idea? Yes, yes. Yeah, just give me an idea. What 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 approach do you choose, and how do you? Like, it? if I want to blur it, the background okay. blur it, or if I want to, uh, like landscape. Mm -hmm. So landscape meaning that I use the f uh, more aperture, like larger mm -hmm. aperture. Mm -hmm. Number actually larger mean number. I use a f eight or f eleven. If so you have both, idea, like, then why do you want to use aperture? Why don't you go to manual mode? Yeah, that's why. That's a beginner. I started with it, but uh, then the people used to say that manual mode is is more professional, something like that. So it's good or how it is. What is your advice? No, for me, I use manual mode because I need things are under my control. You know what I find is I very, very specifically I would like to tell you that means when you use aperture mode, suppose you find uh, you know uh, you know a shutter speed. If you use manual mode, suppose you are using a 3.2 aperture and 160, you know, shutter speed. If you use manual, sometimes you can get 200 shutter speed. You know, it changes. You know, it yeah. depends. It depends on on you know different times. I find it is magically it is totally different than the automatic settings, and the result is automatically to totally different. Uh, you know, because it is controlled by your your camera, but the other one is just uh, you know handy and everything is open for you. So you know, if you have enough time, like you are not running after some time, you are not running after a wild tiger, or you are not running after a, you know um, a sports chase, then uh, use manual mode. Or if you are busy after something, then use any of this mode. If you're busy, you are engaged, you don't have time to change, then use either aperture mode according to the situation. Because if you know the aperture, what you want to set, set that aperture and, uh, you know, shoot it. Or if you, if you are afraid of your shutter, that means, you know, if you think that shutter is there less, then your picture will be blurry and keep that shutter and leave the aperture free. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Dr. Das got some doubt, I think. Das, das you can ask a question. Uh, I had the same query that for a basic person who is starting up, uh, 
whether he should start right with the manual mode or he should uh, play around with the aperture or shutter and uh, let the camera decide the other two and start learning on that basis. For Hello. Who's writing on the screen? Somebody is sharing the screen. You can all see my screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Doctor, uh, you, you, how long you're using the camera now? Uh, I haven't uh, used it regularly, so that's why I keep on having doubts of different types. So, the, uh, what, what would be your uh, advice? So, suppose you go for a uh, outdoor photography for a scenery or a, let's say a building or something. So, uh, would it be? I I I know. You know, under manual, you are telling that everything is under your control. You can decide. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, who is writing in the screen? Somebody is writing. Somebody is writing. Can you raise, please? It's like looks like kids. Uh, oh, oh. No, no, it's not kids because the letters are very correct. <laughs> this is the best you can write on this. Those who wrote, uh, can you, uh, I mean, go, uh, erase it? No, no, no. Okay. Just go there. Yes. Uh, okay. okay, doctor, I'll come back to you. Uh, you know, okay. Uh, okay. Now, let's say you give me a scenario where you want to shoot. What, what are you shooting at the moment? Let's say outside scenery. Some, some scenery, something I'm shooting. Uh, you, you know, you're shooting, a, you know, a landscape? Yeah, landscape, yep. Yeah, uh, let so, me tell you that. If there is no light at all, okay? If there is no light at all, if you have enough light, if you have enough light or enough shutter speed there, uh, you know, you can you can go with uh, you know the setting, but if you don't have enough light, then you have to compromise on your aperture. Suppose I want aperture eight, but the problem is I don't have enough light, so I can come down to five point six, or I can even come down to four. Okay, this works really, but people they are they they have a mindset that landscape should be shot, uh, you know, uh, eight plus four. No, you can even shoot a landscape by two point eight. There are certain issues that you can also solve if you practice that. Now, let me tell you, you know, this is again depends upon the things what you shoot. As I told you before, you are a, you know, a beginner. The problem with the beginner, what happens is the beginner will get an underexposed photo or an overexposed photo, or he will get a blurry photo. These three things are happening. Now, why you are getting a blurry photo? Blurry photo you are getting because you don't have enough shutter speed or your camera is shaky. You know, when you shoot, it will be shaky. Okay. Otherwise, you know, uh, that is the reason you're getting a blurry photo. Now, overexposed to photo, it's happening. Why? Because you are more extra light. Now, underexposed photo, you have less light. This is why it is happening is your camera setting is not proper or not proper each and every time. You are shooting, turn towards something and then you turn 300, you know, to 180 degree and you shoot something and totally different photo because the lighting conditions, both sides are totally different. Now, if you understand this, if you know this and you have enough time, you are easy. You are not running after some time. The time will wait for you. Or maybe you are asking your child to, you know, pose for a photograph and then you have enough time because he will wait for you. Then you do manual and try to practice and see your exposure is proper or not. You know, even the exposure, suppose you put aperture mode and your exposure meter is showing you 100% accurate, even still, there is a possibility that you can get your photo underexposed or overexposed. There's something we use, uh, you know, that is called exposure compensation that we'll talk about later. So that is the reason. But manually, now, even if your you know, exposure is properly right, you have the option to you know, turn one once again and keep a little bit more. You don't have to care about your exposure meter. Rather, you see the picture and if you feel that it's rightly exposed, though that means you have enough time. But at the same time, as I told you before, you are after a wildlife scenario, you are running after a wildlife, you have no time, then you have to, you don't have time to set all these three. 
So what you do is in that case, you put your camera aperture mode or shutter mode. It's again, it depends upon the speed what you need. Suppose you are shooting a you know, hummingbird, which is requiring, which uh, requests you know, more than 4,000 shutter speed. But when you do that, you cannot go for aperture mode because aperture mode maybe will not give you the shutter speed. So you have to stick with your shutter speed, what you really require. So that time you are not caring about the aperture. The best aperture possible will be controlled by the camera. The similarly, the second scenario, as I told you before, when you do the panning, you are concentrating only on shutter. That is the time you use shutter mode and leave the aperture for you know, you, you know your camera and the vice versa. Suppose I'm shooting a fashion mode. I want to shoot everything with 1.4 because I've purchased the lens by paying a lot of money and the aperture is 1.4. I'm going to shoot all the my pictures with 1.4. Some people, they say, if you shoot with 1.4, the picture will be blurry, the nose will be blurry, and the you know, ear will be blurry, all that there. But people who knows how to use it, they know how to manage it. So in that particular case, I'll keep my you know camera on 1.4 and I leave the shutter for my camera to handle, okay? Because that's the best possible way I can handle. So this is again, depends upon the situation. But here, what you try to achieve as a beginner, that means you don't want to control all of them. You want the camera to take care of half of the responsibility. So that's why what I understood, most of the people, they go with aperture or shutter because of this reason. Uh, camera screen is gone. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I changed the setting one second because uh, someone was playing. Uh, just give me a second. Okay, uh, I think there were a few other questions. Uh, yeah. Earlier, there was someone was asking what is uh, Polaroid uh, photography. And mm -hmm. uh, I forgot who asked, it was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, if I understood correctly, this is for uh, instant photography. Lipin, it was asked by one Naushin. Okay. Yeah. Naushin. So there are uh, addresses you want to explain? Or? Yeah. Okay, sir. yeah so right, so photography is the same thing. and uh, It's on instant photo uh, cameras, actually. So you can take it on a... Uh, Pepper, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah. Yeah. Uh, they want to know the concept of Polaroid photography, you mean? Yeah, that is, I think it is a chat question. Yeah, it was in chat. Uh, he was asking what is uh, Polaroid photography. Okay. Just, uh, I will tell you this thing. Uh, the Polaroid, I believe, is not exist anymore. It was there earlier, before when film camera was coming. The Polaroid film also used to come. The people who work, uh, the people who wants photo immediately, the concept is same. The Polaroid cameras had no uh, manual mode and all. The basic Polaroid camera, it's a pointed shoot camera. Instead of a uh, film. That film, we take a pictures, we develop in the lab and get the prints. The Polaroid camera had a film, including the paper. The film process, uh, when you take a picture, it process the chemical to um, process the complete of uh, image. Then it prints on the paper and you pull it out and dry it. That's, that's the, the concept of Polaroid camera as here before. Nowadays, no Polaroid anymore. Okay, I think uh, Vaira Prakash, you wanted to ask something? I saw you have raised the hand. And answer. I want to stick with only those questions regarding what I was talking because we cannot go wild here because we have a limited time to complete certain things. So I request everybody to stick with only all those modes, what we were discussing about it. And let's go ahead. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you can share again. Thank you, Mr. Syed, and I hope you guys will be here to intervene whenever we require.
Okay, uh, this is what uh, the modes, and now these uh, are I the think, modes. Uh, sorry, uh, plus is one more question. I think uh, Kamran was asking what can you elaborate shutter speed? Uh, yeah, I think we will go into more detail later on, right, uh, Abulasis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we are going to. Next uh, question answer is now we are finishing here. We are going, and the next again we'll stop, and that time we can discuss. Okay, shall I go ahead, Libin? Please. Now, these are the models we were talking, modes we were talking before, sports, action mode, landscape mode, macro mode, and portrait modes, and different camera companies, they say, and this is, you know, these are the settings, you know, but again, these are automatic setting. They made it from somewhere, according to that light, maybe, or this is based on a thousands of, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a database of thousands of something like that. But again, you know how it should be. Don't make a camera into a point and shoot camera by using this kind of thing. This is my simple advice. And you will never learn. I have seen people using camera for 13 years to 17 years, still asking me what is this aperture for. Did you look at some of the, the you know, aperture used in that particular photo? So then don't use all those things. You are converting your camera to a point and shoot camera if you are using these modes. Rather, you try to identify it because when you have a camera, it means you are ready to learn something. You want to, you know, you have to invest some time. It's not that much. It's, it's everything is around you. Every information is at your fingertips. So give us a little bit of time. Let me tell you, ask you a question. How many days would you take to understand the manual mode? Do you need five years to do that? Do you need one year? I don't think you need more than half an hour or one day, two day. Do it for half a day or one day or two day or five day. Within five day, understand and try another 10 days only for shooting practices with that. Then you're done. But you're not doing this. You're asking me a question that why this mode and what mode I should use. No, I don't think you need more than one day to understand manual mode. And then you take one month to practice the same thing. Every day you try to shoot minimum 10 photos. You shoot more than 300 photos and you have a good hand in man and you are a good guy then with the camera. So I find people using a camera for 10 years and asking me the same question. I really don't want to answer those questions because I know that they're just asking and they have been asking this question for the last 10 different workshops without getting results. I don't like this and I'm not interested to answer that question. And same thing, same question I repeated three times here also, but same answer. I've heard this, this question for the last, you know, four or five years from my life. People are asking, still they are asking. Even tomorrow they will ask you the same question. But my request, if you want to learn photography, please guys, stop here and look at the manual mode. Try to explore that. You don't need more on a choice on that. Then practice for one month, two months, and use it yourself. You will see the change. Okay. Then you can answer the question by yourself. So next time, this is the last time you're going to ask this question. Now today you are going to learn about manual mode, and you are going to practice and shoot minimum 500 photos using manual mode, and you have it in your pocket. That's it. Now these are the controls you need to know. The basic, and you have a lot of different controls, but we are not talking about all that. We are talking about a few controls. Okay. So one is the image playback, zoom in and out, because I want to show you this particular zoom in and out. Why? Because when we talk about manual focusing, you need to know what is zoom button, because uh, you, know, you can look at your screen and you can zoom in and then you can focus when you're using a, a manual lens. Maybe this will help you when you do astrophotography and those kind of stuff. Even it's quite good night photo for night photography as well as uh, you know, uh, landscape photography. And the next one is a delete image and direct printing and video mode and night mode or long exposure mode. Okay, so these are four different, uh, you know, six different modes I just want to show you because we will discuss about it later. I'm not going to discuss a lot of other things, just these because we're going to talk about it in the later course. Now, let's just have a quick look at a, a lens. You know, you know the thread of lens, and you know, and these are some parts. You know, friend lens element, manual focusing ring, distance scale. Some people they don't know what is that. Doing zoom ring is different. 
you know, uh, manual focusing is, ring is different. And lens mount, you have to take care very, very carefully. And in some lens, you will find image stabilization. Some lens you will find, you know, recently one of my friend, he said he purchased a lens, uh, you know, a Canon lens for 300 reals. Actually, somebody cheated him. He purchased a 7300 lens for 300 reals. Somebody told him it's a wildlife, you know, lens and without image stabilization. So let's have a discussion. What is image stabilization? Have you heard about that? So now please note this point, image stabilization. Some lens, they say it is VR, vibration control. Now what happens is, uh, the longer your lens, you know, the movement is more. If you, you know, you use a lens, you look at something and you point at something, normally the internal element of your lens may, you know, vibrate, it tend to vibrate. So there will be, you know, stabilization, uh, you know, um, mechanism inside your lens and that will control this movements okay so if you have an image stabilization you can switch it on while you're shooting at the same time image stabilization when you shoot a long exposure photography people say it is not good to you know switch it on and also ultrasonic motors which will uh, you know uh, control your focusing and moving of your you know lens but the problem comes if you don't have the right motor on your camera on your lens when you take a video you will have a lot of lot of unnecessary noise and your movements of the cam you know lens up and down will not be proper so this is i just leave it for you today to for you to give a you know homework and for a discussion tomorrow so you have to look at this one image stabilization and ultrasonic motors why because you're going to buy a lot of lenses in the future or maybe you're going to plan to buy one or two lenses so you need to know these things and uh, try to gather some information we will discuss tomorrow not today so i just leave it to you now let's come and talk about different types of lenses okay we have normal standard lenses wide angle lenses telephoto lenses super wide angle lenses fisheye lenses and macro lenses and uh, there are different types of lenses like you know uh, which you know particular lenses which we we talk later in the course, but these are the normal types of lenses what we use in, in, in a photography uh, scenario. Now, we'll also talk about why these lenses and what are these lenses, how they work, but let me just work on this aperture, then go back to that, because there is a particular reason why I'm doing this. Now, let's talk about aperture. And you know what is aperture. Can you see this picture, everybody? Similarly, your eye your eye does the same when you have a lot of light your eye you know shrinks or maybe reduces that hole and when you don't have enough light when you're in a dark room your eye will open up as much as possible this is a similar mechanism we are using inside a camera inside a camera lens please look at these two pictures Lens aperture, similarly with human eye. So you understood what is aperture. Aperture means the whole of the lens, okay? Normally this whole of the lens, if you look at the second picture, you will find them, they are not a single, you know, they are, this hole is constituted by a different, different uh, aperture blades. So if you look at that, See now this is, you know, when it's fully open, you will find the full ring. When it goes inside, you will find it's not the full full ring. Rather, you will find a kind of a pentagon or a hexagon type of, uh, you know, shape inside that. And this will also be very useful to create a beautiful looking, you know, bouquet in your, you know, in your photograph. So please just have a look at this. This aperture hole is created by using aperture blades. Good quality, you know, lenses, they have, uh, you know, more number of uh, aperture blades and, uh, you know, they can give you much beautiful looking, you know, bouquets. We'll talk about bouquets in the coming slides now. These are, uh, you know, let's say aperture one, if you find it there, but I didn't find any aperture one, but there is nothing to open up then. Then the second one is aperture 1.4 f2 
2.8 and these are the different aperture. Here I would like you to notice one thing. When you say f32, you have to understand that the hole of your lens is very small. When I say my aperture is 1.4, you have to understand that your aperture hole is very big. Okay? You got that everybody? Yes. Okay, when yes. your aperture is 1.4, that means you got a big hole. When you say your aperture is f32, that means you got a very small hole. Here, two things you have to understand. When the number is less, you have a big hole. When the number is big, your hole is small. Now, similarly, when your number is small, you have a big hole, that means you get a lot of light. When you have your number is big, that means you don't have enough light. You have a very small hole and that can give you a small amount of light to get inside. Let's talk about a pipe throwing water out. If F1.4 can throw a lot of light outside, a lot of water outside, but F32 will not give you much water. Am I right or wrong? Okay, so that is the reason. Now, if you look at F2, it's comparatively a smaller hole. F2.8 is getting smaller. F4, it's again smaller, 5.6, and it's coming to 32, the last one, it's much, much smaller. You will find light very less. So do you understand, if the number is less, that means you get a lens with a lot of light. If the number is more, you get a lens with a very less amount of light. Now, if you look at any lens with 1.4, you have to pay a lot of money. But at the same time, an average lens was starting from 3.5 or 4 will not charge you much money because they don't give you much light and they are not so popular among you know, professional photographers. So even wildlife photographers, they spend a lot of money for f2.8 lens, you know, a long range 600 mm lens with f2.8 and lesser than that. So that is the thing we learned from here. Please do understand 1.4 or a lesser aperture, lesser number will give you a lot of light and that's what, you know, allow you to capture a lot of, lot of, lot of light, okay? But that number is less, but number goes up, you get very less amount of light, okay? Now, what happens when we change our aperture? Suppose if you are using aperture 2.8, what is happening? You have five people standing there. And if you are on an aperture 2.8, it's not they're all standing in one level. This is just uh, you know, an approximate uh, you know, measurement. So don't consider this an exact measurement that depends upon different other aspects here. Uh, we say that, uh, you know, you, suppose you have five people standing and you are on an F2 point aperture, you get the first person on focus and rest of them are not in focus. Similarly, if you increase your aperture to four, what happens is you will bring one more person or a secondary element, or you get more depth of field. You can add more space, clarity into your picture, then you get three others, you know, uh, not in picture, or maybe blurred, or maybe we say shallow depth of field. They are there, but they're not clear. So that's what we call, they're not in the depth of field. Depth of field means whatever is, clearly coming to your picture. Okay, that is depth of field. Now here, if you look at that, these are the different aperture used. When you use 16 aperture, you will find everybody in the picture because they are in different layers, different planes. They are not in one plane. Now, wherever you hit the camera, suppose you are hitting the first person, suppose you think that you are hitting the third person, okay, focusing the third person, that means, okay, one third of friend side is in focus and two third from behind her is in focus and the rest of them are in not in focus. So that is not in focus, we call shallow depth of field. Those who are in focus, we call, you know, they are in focus and this is called depth of field. Now, the person, the third person, if you are focusing, that is your focus plane. From that, one point, one, one third front side and two third back side are 
only in accepted focal length. Am I clear, guys? You're listening to me properly, right? Yes. I feel yes. I'm sitting in the room and talking to myself because nobody is to say anything and a kind of really, really boring thing it is. So once uh, in a while... Uh, Abdul, can you, Abdul, can you repeat that last one? One third and the two third? Yeah. That means suppose you are hitting a plane. You know, you are, you know, suppose you have a child standing maybe 10 feet, uh, you know, in front of you and you are focusing that child, okay? And then the child is in focus with the, you know, whoever's standing same, uh, you know, distance with that child is in real focus. Now, two thirds from that distance behind her is in focus, but that is only accepted focus. And one third in front of her is also in focus, but that is also accepted focus. We can accept that things are clear, but they are not so sharp as the focus plane. I got it? Okay. Now, yep. well, how can we use that? Is sometimes I find, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hitting an object 10 feet in front of me and one third of that in focus. After one third, I have another small flower. That flower, when I, you know, including that flower, if I take a photo, that flower will not be a flower, but that flower will render only a kind of creamy color into my picture. Now, what happens is, suppose you keep your finger, just maybe, uh, you know, uh, just maybe, uh, you know, 20 or, you know, yeah, 20, 10 centimeter in front of your eyes and look at the tip of your finger. So you see what? You see only the tip of your finger and rest of everything is in blur, right? Now, similarly, now that distance, 10 centimeter, you increase a little more ahead. You make it 20 centimeter, look at you can see more things in focus. You can see more things clearly. Now, if you keep that finger again, maybe one meter away, you can see a lot more other things than the, your finger in the picture. That means the distance also matters. Now, let's talk about this particular picture. We say that 2.8, if I'm trying to shoot these five people, similar to the, the way they adjusted in the screen, so what happens, I get only the first person. But if I move behind to another five more meters or 10 more meters, what happens? I get more people with the same aperture. You got it. So depth of field can be controlled by two elements. One is your distance between you and the camera. At the same time, the aperture opening. Suppose you have only two point aperture. You're getting only, only the first person. You don't want to change your aperture. You want to get more people into the screen. What will you do? My question. Anybody can answer. Suppose you look at the come, first picture. Come closer. First picture. Come, close. come closer. You will not get more because now first picture you're getting only one person and your aperture is 2.8. I don't want to change my aperture, but I need to get the second person also in the picture. What should I do? I, I have to distance. go back from this distance. Yeah, you have to go back as simple as it is. Yeah, and you try to increase the distance between you and the object, then automatically the one third also will increase, right? One third of yes. the object, that means it's a comparative measurement. When I go, you know, 100 meters away, I need only 2.8 to get all the five people in the screen. You don't need to worry about that. So that matters only when you are, how much far you are from the object. That is a, that is the thing. So if your subject is very tiny, go so close to it, okay? So to create something, and I'll show you what are the creative things which you can do with this. Now, if you look at these pictures, can you see these pictures? Now, these are creative things people created. It's, these are not my photos. People created using, you know, aperture different aperture. Sometimes it is really funny to have, uh, you know, some very wide opening aperture to play with. Can you see, you know, you know, if you look at the first picture, can somebody tell me what kind of aperture it should be? An approximate guess. I don't want you to be 100% rich, but people who knows photography, they can get you an average idea what kind of an aperture, the first picture. Anybody can give me an answer. 
Anybody there? 2.8. About 2.8. I would say it is 1.8. What about the last picture, that lady? 1.4. I would say this is 3.2. Now, this is a thing, what I am saying, let it be right or wrong. What I want you guys to understand is, look at the photos and try to understand the temperature from the photo. See a lot of photo and see what is happening. Now, you can do a good practice with a picture. I'll give an exercise for all of you. And can you give me an answer tomorrow? Do you have two bottles in your home? Yes. One bottle on the end of the you know, table and the second bottle maybe after half a 30 centimeter or 50 centimeters away. Try to focus on the first bottle and try to get a picture with the highest aperture what you have, which means the lowest number. Let's say 1.4 or 1.8 or maybe 3.5, whatever. And try to get one more picture with an average aperture of around 5.6. Try to get a third picture with eight up. Try to get the last picture with uh, 16 aperture. Now, you try to come back, magically you will understand how does this aperture behave. You know, sometimes aperture when you increase, the, you know, bigger aperture, if you see all of them are, you know, very soft, creamy kind of background, okay? Uh, that kid's photo is 1.4 aperture. I guess you kind of creamy background, okay? Now, if you look at that grass photo, you see something in front is not focused, something in the back side is also not focused. Which one is focused? The only the middle area, the grasses are focused. Why? Because that is the focus plane. Whatever from the front side is not focused, that means it is after one third of the distance. And the, similarly, you can see backside also, there is nothing more in focus. That means it is used to very lowest approach. Okay, so it is a good practice that whenever you see these kind of photos, just go after them and see what kind of approach. Just look only approach. Don't look at shadow screen. Don't look at ISO and don't write it down. Don't say that, oh, I can do the same photo because I got the XF. It's bullshit. I'm sorry for my language. You will not do that. You will just see the aperture. Why? Because you are trying to work on only on aperture. Try to create something by using your aperture. You know, if you have a you know lens with 1.8, try to reduce your you know put an aperture for 1.4 or 1.8. If you have a 50 lens, the best lens for this is and the cheap lens for this is you know 50 mm 1.8. Uh, 50 mm 1. Point lens is you know can can do a similar kind of photography. You know, most of the people I find around me are using 1.8 mm lens, but still you can get a lot of uh, you know magical try some experiment then you will understand it's not somebody's uh, some disturbing sound is coming a little bit somebody's yeah i disabled okay. i disabled that yeah okay. okay now this is what i need you to practice not to ask every workshop what is that approach what is approach mode what is the priority mode now you do this practice now, I'll ask you a question. How many days you want to do this practice? You got a lot of, lot of, lot of free hours at your home. Okay? When you stop fighting with your wife, it's good time. Take your camera. Go there. Put something. Put something behind that. Then you try to get a shot. Try to blur your background. Then you get a kind of color. Then you do one thing. Try to get another color. Try to get a blue color and a red color mix. Try to blur them, get a shot. And see what kind of a background you get thing if this is what you need or you want something more in focus try to increase your shutter speed uh, you know air pressure try to get another shot so this is the practice you can do and you will not need more than two or three days practice to master this how many days do you need this you don't need but people they don't do this they tend to ask the same question next time which mode do you use which one i should work which aperture i should choose no Work and do it. Same picture you shoot with the different, uh, different uh, you know, aperture and you will find the difference. You will see the background and the changes, the hardness of your background, the thickness of your background, you know, 
those kind of things you will understand by yourself then you can say which aperture you are shooting which aperture you love to shoot and then that is your personal preference set that up then you are the master of that thing and one more thing i would like to say if you have three lenses please believe me don't shoot three of them with a similar way three of them will give you top three different ways you have to try all your lenses you know different differently don't do one lens and the same setting will not be applicable for others every lens will have its own sweet spot and other aspects that you have to learn the perspective of that lens the light uh, rendering capacity of that lens and uh, the bokeh capacity of that lens and lot 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 more things so try to and also there are some lenses that can give you a lot of you know uh, distortion and there are some lenses that can give you you know much creamier background so every lens is different similarly when i got my first 2470 believe me for 6 7 months i didn't touch it because whenever you shoot you get a kind of weird looking photos now you ask me that is one of my favorite photos because just watching one guy i saw faisal shaksi he was shooting only with 2470 i thought why is such a great photographer guy mr faisal shooting with such a weird lens then i understood there is something funny in that that's why this guy is this gentleman is using that then i started working on that working on that working on that now this became one of my favorite lenses in my kit i love to shoot with 2470 but if you don't know it will be one of the weirdest lenses i've seen so many people they purchased this lens and they sold it why because they just didn't know how to use it but if you use it you master it and you will love those kind of things but you need practice without practice don't look at my setting try to copy with a different you are copying my except with a different lens different camera different lighting condition then i will call you a fool so please don't do that there is no as such universal settings please work with your lens try to work on different aperture and see how things are getting done and then you make a, a you know a your own you know a, a kind of a book where you get your things done okay so that's what i my advice on this and i'll show you a couple of other photos now this particular photo there is nothing blur because you need from friend to the top in focus so here i would like to go for the aperture where that can give me better photos now this is a kind of mediocre photo it doesn't cover a lot of things in that maybe uh, maybe 1 1 kilometer 2 kilometer within this time so i don't i'm not going for a hyper uh, you know kind of focal length uh, 11 plus no i want something uh, you know something around uh, you know uh, you know 8 to 11 because if you if you you know increase your shutter speed you know uh, sorry uh, increase your uh, aperture more you know you'll have a lot of light problems you get your background a kind of hard background which will not be a kind of soft looking background so there are problems because this distortion is happening think about through a small uh, you know a hole water is getting in so water doesn't come in okay water will tend to go to both side of the hole and it will spread that similarly the light will not directly come and hit you light will tend to go to both the sides you know it will you know take a curve both the side and it will go to both the sides so that is we call that can create a kind of a distorted photos so which is not a good advice so try to stick within the beginning something around 8 to 11 for landscape don't go for 16 22 32 and you end up with some kind of hard looking tough looking and you know kind of distorted for those don't go for that but you can also venture based on your requirement suppose how you have two different objects you try to capture them together and it is not happening then try to increase and you know try to reduce and work with a mediocre you know level of uh, uh no um, uh, you know uh, a pressure which i i really recommend a to between 11 maximum 13 in the beginning abdul this is chandrakant one second uh, can i just uh, button if you don't mind please uh i think dr das uh, earlier was asking about the landscape uh, photography uh, dr das uh, as uh, abdul aziz was uh, pointing out if you want to do a landscape photography uh, when with, this is uh, chandrakant ji abdul aziz okay uh if you want to do landscape photography you are i think asking uh, how to do we will not answer specific questions now 
that we are coming. We are not yeah, okay. asking. There is no particular answer. You can give one answer saying that a uh, landscape will be done with this aperture. I think. No, I just wanted to say that you know, uh, if you don't have very harsh light, uh, eight to eleven, as what you are saying, uh, aperture eight to eleven should so be a good aperture. That point by point, why it is yeah. that? Why we select an aperture? We'll come to that. We don't want to give any exit number to somebody. We okay. recommend to stick with the mediocre level aperture. Yeah. Good. What good. just your screen? Okay. We don't give any setting to anybody. We don't say this setting, this aperture, no. Try to check with and try to increase after that, you know, between 13 to 20, 32, whatever aperture you get and see what happens to your photo. And you will see yourself, then you don't have to wait for somebody's answer, okay? So that's what my advice, try to take a photo. Now, people said, use eight to 11 aperture for a landscape. Okay, you have a lens with 2.8. Do you try for 2.8 and see what is the difference? I can bet you 100% if you take a you know, landscape with 2.8, you will not notice much difference. You will still get a clear picture. Again, that depends on the closest object of your picture. Now, the closest object of your first picture is less than two, three feet, right? Am I right or wrong? You guys are listening. But the second one is similarly, it gives me more, more space. Again, that is also that depends. Suppose you have a plane, you have nothing in front of you. You can go with 2.8 aperture. Try to shoot it. Try to shoot with that. Try to shoot with four and six and see the difference. And you know that this photo looks good because I did it because maybe this particular situation, I require this. And come to that point. Don't take any advice from anybody. I don't like it and I don't want you to give such advice. Just don't try and don't stick with any numbers. Don't stick with any idea because no preset here. You try. Try today when you go, you know, if you, after the lockdown, if you get a time or maybe you go to your terrace, take a shot of your city using 2.8 aperture if you have 2.8. Same thing you do with 8th aperture. Then go to the room and try to check what is happening. What is the real difference? All these people are telling what? Feel it. You feel it, you touch it, and you take it into your heart. Then you know that. Otherwise, until unless, just you will beat around these numbers and you will not reach anywhere. Please, my guys. Okay. Now, let's stick with this shutter. Shutter, do you know how this shutter is working? Uh, Abdul, this is uh, just yeah. a second. Uh, we, yeah, we have, it's going to be 8.30. So, Fine. you wanted to continue right now or maybe tomorrow? Shutter. No, let's stop it because most of the people they are expecting one hour and maybe yeah. they came. Okay, so we'll wind up for any questions and we'll answer, then we'll uh, move to the next day. Any quick questions? Okay, here we have, uh, you know, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, the, tomorrow uh, when we continue the session, uh, everybody is listening? Yes. Tomorrow when we continue the session, I want people to do a small homework. Those who get time, those who, you know, are not free, not a problem. Uh, try to show some creativity using your aperture. Okay. Try to show some creativity using your aperture. Uh, we'll try to get best within your, you know, your inside your home using your table or maybe using your windowsill, or maybe using your you know, sunshade, put something here, put something behind, put, bring some different colors, or maybe you bring a bottle, when you blur it, you may get a different color than a bottle there. So these kind of things are magically adding to your, try to bring some creative things tomorrow. The first 10 minutes tomorrow, we'll be discussing, we'll discuss this, okay? So please, that is one exercise for all of you. Try to put that and everybody put your camera on manual mode, just on manual mode and just try to set it and then work on it. Okay. So this is a, just a try, try it and let's discuss tomorrow first was 10 minutes and see how you feel about your aperture. Now what you can talk about your aperture tomorrow. All right, guys, I hope it was, you know, uh, my friends and I, I, I try to stop people who are intervening with their own ideas because I have a preset idea how to conduct this.
this workshop because I don't want, because I've been to several, several, you know, workshops. Now I'm not going to any more workshops. Why? Because these kind of things are getting repeated. I'm unfortunately, I found my people, um, some of my friends with uh, five, six years with the camera asking the same question. I heard them asking five years before, same thing. Now they're asking similar questions. And I also heard people that are answering the similar question five years back, but they are also struggling without getting a clear idea. So this is the reason why we are not going for that. We will feel during this course, we need everybody to feel what we are talking about and we need everybody to work on it. Now tomorrow, please try to do something with the aperture, try to see how does it work and we will discuss. Thank you so much for being with me. Good luck to you all. Uh, bless you. Yeah. I think there were uh, some questions. Abhi, you are trying to ask something. I didn't really understand uh, your question. The first point I didn't understand. Abhi, you are here? Okay. Uh, okay, any other questions? I think Abhi was trying to say that this is not a pressure, so I didn't really understand what he said. The next one he asked about the, uh, I think, uh, micro lens. So, uh, yeah, micro lens, we can use 100 mm, 2.8, or uh, any other lens, subtleties we can use for micro. There are a specific uh, macro technology like uh, people they have uh, you know 105 Canon lens and then 90 mm this uh, Tamron lens. I don't know much about uh, you know Nikon lenses. Maybe Syed can advise you on that. And also there are different ways. You have a macro you know uh, lens uh, you can attach on the top of any lens. You know a magnifying lens you can attach. That is also people using. You can also you attach. A hollow tube, you know, vacuum tube uh, between your camera and the lens, and you can use that as a, you know, magnifier. And also, you can reverse, you know, your uh, your lenses and connect to your camera. But you need special adapters for that. So there are different ways to use them. But normally, you can buy some macro lenses. Uh, they are one to one. There are if one to five uh, times magnification available. There are some expensive lenses as well available for that. But normally, we use Canon guys, they use one point, uh, I think 105 uh, mm lens and the Tamron, I have another one, another lens, 95 mm. Uh, before going further, uh, those who can uh, enable your video, I want to take a group shot. Normally I take a group shot uh, on the, uh, all the workshops we conduct. Uh, so, uh, Abdulaziz, can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. And uh, those who have video and ready to enable, please. So I'm going to take a screenshot. All are ready. Uh, I have a few more uh, window for some. Okay. Lexan. Oh, is that okay? We are ready. One, two, three. Just hold on. One second. Okay, one more. Ready? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Lipin, uh, before uh, we leave, uh, I just like to ask like one question, Mr. Abdulaziz. Uh, hi, sorry. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm. I'm extremely. I, I mean, I've had a. I've had a camera for uh, some time, but uh, not really used it. Like you said, I. Uh, I was using it more like a point and shoot. Uh, I was just trying to use the aperture mode right now and uh, thing. I. I have a 1855, okay. and uh, I think the minimum uh, aperture uh, is goes down to 3.5. Yeah. Fine. Uh, but I, I found that, uh, you know, I was just trying to shoot something on my table here, just some, uh, DO bottles and, uh, in certain cases it doesn't, uh, I mean, it doesn't go down below four, 4.8, 4.5. I cannot move it down. It happens. You have you know, a variable like whenever you zoom in, that aperture goes up, you know? Uh-huh. 
uh, the normally without zooming in, maybe that's three point five. But when you zoom in, it's good. if you look at the lens, you know, okay. it's written three point five to five point five something. Okay. So when you maximum zoom in, it goes high. When you when you reduce the zoom out, when you zoom out and come to the normal position, you'll find it's three point five something like that. So that is the reason the aperture is changing. But in this case, what you can do is you can move towards the. But still, there is a you know you know a minimum distance between you and the subject. Uh, you cannot go beyond that. So be stick with that limit. Then try to get a shot with the limited uh, maximum you know wide open, and you get better results. You will find them it is different. Try working on that. Okay, as okay, you said, uh, as you one. Said, sorry. Uh, I also found that uh, I mean I've put it on the uh, aperture mode, the A, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but I find that the shutter speed is uh, I mean very slow, so the image is is as is blurred. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. why? What is your aperture? How much is your aperture? I've kept it at the minimum. I mean, when I'm taking this, say, with uh, yeah. if it's uh, on a close shot like 4.8, okay. uh, I still find that. You know the the shutter speed is. Uh, yeah, here I would like to ask you like this: Your shutter is three point five. Still, you don't have enough light. That means you are in a dark room. You have to open up your room, or you have to go out. Or oh, the thing is, what is when you have to have external lights? There's no other way. Any of these great guys here, we have we know their Libin here, Mr. Shang Sumesh is there, Dharma is here. All these great guys, and KK, I think KK is here. There are so many of these guys are there. So uh, Chandra Gandhi is here. All these guys, they know photography for a long time. They don't, uh, uh, nobody, nobody can, can use, use light. Nobody can take a picture. So I go to a room, my aperture is even 1.4. My shutter is only 80. Nobody can give you the answer. Use a torch. That's the only thing I can tell you. So go to a place where you have enough light or you bring additional light and take a picture. And also you can do something. Do you have a big Bartanka, uh, you know, that can in your home that can reflect light as well? So these are the things what people do. There is no other way. So try to go to a place where you get more light because you have no choice than increasing your ISO now. But the 3.5, still you are not getting the right picture with the right shutter speed. That means the light is very less. Even if you use your ISO, you will get a very noisy picture. So that will be a waste of time, you know. Open up all your windows. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay, any other questions? Sumerji, Namaskar. Chandra Gandhi, some of the features uh -huh. I know. Uh, I think we'll wind up for today. And a yeah. uh, few important points I want to repeat again. Uh, when you join, give your actual name. And I want to detect because you know, uh, there are members, new members join and I don't know them. And uh, that's why even the WhatsApp group, I'm asking to introduce yourself. Uh, okay, then uh, what else? Uh, Libin, uh, yeah. who has done that uh, scribbling actually? That was quite... Actually, I have to uh, check because, up because uh, I... This, this, uh, yeah. has, uh, this used to happen in, uh, you know, like a kid's uh, classroom in, initially, not now. <laughs> initially, they used to do, but yeah. here it happened, I don't know, uh, yeah. which was unfortunate. Uh, that's why uh, you know you have we because uh, unfortunately I don't have a setting to just to control that one because I uh, need to stop uh, uh, you know giving access to everyone or uh, this one so uh, there is no separate okay. option for that. Share screen okay. I couldn't find maybe it is there okay. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but uh, the member has to be careful otherwise I need yep. to restart uh, stop and start again. Uh, Libin, you can you can control the this on screen. Who can share the screen? You can in, in the beginning itself. You can introduce. Yes, yes. I, now there's new security. It's uh, I can enable it, but it is not only for one person. It's for everyone. So uh, when I enable for uh, participants, everyone can do uh, something. So or or else, uh, Libin, you can do like the like this. Uh, see uh, what happened last time. I don't want to make a big uh, this one. In Indian school, uh, Dar said once when they were taking the class, this option was open. So somebody posted some yes, kind of yes, yes, this yes. one. Yeah, that, that we know. Uh, that That's the reason we ah. are taking all the precautions. So what, uh, yeah. so but that's unfortunately, where, there is no separate setting for that. I could not. No, no, uh, listen. Uh, yeah. This is why, why, because I tell this one, we do not know many of the members, those who have joined. 
in this particular this session or maybe the tomorrow and after tomorrow so i from my side personally i think uh, better uh, mr abdul aziz can share uh, his uh, this one uh, what the powerpoint presentation to you and meanwhile he is introducing you can keep it uh, 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 changing the screens or this one yeah we will see because you know he also lose that flexibility of uh, himself managing it so it's okay we will uh, try to do uh, you know uh, what uh, what is possible because all right uh, we have to consider all the aspects that's a good anyway thing. yeah thank you for uh, lexan for the so uh, that's all so see you tomorrow and uh, once again thank you for joining uh, good thank night you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you for everybody thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you thank you everybody good going